You've tuned in to the Beyond Hope podcast, your access to success strategies and more to help you survive and thrive through your loved one's addiction challenges while you move onward and upward with your life. Now, here's your host, Char Jones. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Beyond Hope Radio. Um, If this is your first time joining me, thank you so much for being here. And to those of you who keep coming back, I'm so grateful for you. Um, Today, I am sharing with you an interview that is really special to me, Um, Andre Washington. I invited him on the show in April of this year. Um, This was post-COVID and before the murder of George Floyd. Um, Andre and I met over interesting circumstances late last year, and um, we have continued to be friends, and he is someone that I care about. He and his family are important to me, and Andre reached out to me after seeing a news post um, that had mentioned my name, and he reached out to me, um, and we just developed a friendship. Um, I had driven past a sign, a Starbucks sign that had um, had the words whites only um, spray painted on it. This was on Halloween, no less. And I flipped a Huey, pulled over, stopped the car, left the car running, um, got out, did a video, posted it, tagged Starbucks, and it got some attention. Um, and Andre reached out to me. And the fact that he reached out to me and knew that I was speaking from my heart about this topic um, really meant a lot to me. And I'm grateful for him. Andre, thank you so much for coming into my life. And I hope that we continue to be friends. I believe that we will be. So I invited Andre to come onto the show to share our personal experience about darkness and hope and what it means to not give up. And I know that all of us can, um, can, can, Think back to a time, maybe you're there now, where you just feel like um, you want to give up or like things are falling down around you. And I I hope that Andre's voice lifts you up today. And I'm going to include a link to his website below. I hope that you check it out. And I'm just sending you so much love and I hope you enjoy. I'll just kind of share a little bit about myself um, and kind of go into a brief details about how, how you and I met. Very special story in my in my opinion. I think so too. Um, even though the circumstances probably weren't the best, but, <laughs> but I think it all worked out for a reason. Yeah. And so when I look back in retrospect, it's like, man, I'm, I'm glad it happened because I wouldn't have made that connection with you. Um, so it's, it's really been great. But no, just a little bit about me. Um, obviously, my name is Andre Washington. I'm originally uh, a Texas native. Um, very, very loud and very proud about uh, <laughs> my origin from Texas, as, as, as you can see. Uh, but I'm, I'm living here in um, the Seattle Tacoma area with my wife and my two children. We have a baby on the way. Congratulations! So, yeah, a little girl. She'll be here in July. So we're excited oh about goodness. that. Um, yeah, we're at quarantine just like everybody else doing this, uh, coronavirus crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, but life is still good. Um, yeah, I, I'm a, a young man who's passionate about his faith, passionate about his family, passionate about seeing other people make progress in life. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I can name a few people who reached out to me throughout my lifetime and has really helped me make progress in life. So I feel that my life's calling, passion, and purpose, why I was created was to reach people. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever that may look like, reach them right where they are, reach reach, reach who they are without asking them to change who they are, um, to inspire them um, so they can have a transformative experience. And that, and that could be a change of thought. Um, that can be going, hey, I never looked at it that way. That can be a change of behavior. Um, so if, if I can have a simple conversation with a person um, and inspire them in such a way to where they, they may want to do something different mm-hmm. um, or do something better and not that they were doing anything bad um, because people say things to me all the time and I kind of go, 
oh man, I, I didn't even look at it that way. And it, and it changes the trajectory of, of where I'm headed. Um, simple conversation. So that's, that's what I want to do and what I feel like I'm called to do. Um, how me and my good friend Cher met, <laughs> it was, uh, was it October? I think it was October of last year. And I was just kind of scrolling up and down on Facebook and I saw a sign a Starbucks sign rather Mm -hmm. and someone spray painted whites only on the sign Mm -hmm. and that caught my attention be it as that I am an African-American man in the Pacific Northwest where probably if if I if I remember the correct number probably 80 to 85 percent of the state is white Um, so out of 7.5 million people you're looking at a little over 200,000 who are African American, but then my I bring a different dynamic because here I am a Southern man mm-hmm. in the Pacific Northwest, which you're talking two completely different cultures on two ends of the spectrum. So it was a big culture shock when I got here. So that that really struck home for me when I was like, okay, whites only, uh, which I'm sure uh, Sharon and I will go into this some other time, but historically. You know, that, that struck a, a chord with me, <laughs> just thinking about what that means for our society from a historical perspective. But anyway, I was curious to know who took that picture. So as I looked up the news reports and everything, Cher's name popped up and I was like, man, I got to reach out to this lady because what she did is she addressed an issue that really she could have easily, as a Caucasian woman, walked away and said, up. Oh, that has nothing to do with me. So, Cher, you you stopped and you went to that Starbucks. And um, as I like to tell people when I tell this story, you some pretty um, encouraging but yet colorful language <laughs> to get them to wake the heck up and realize, hey, this is not OK. Somebody needs to do something about it, regardless of, of who sprayed that on the sign, yeah. regardless of what the color of their skin was. This is not OK. And with that being said, I sent um, Cher a message and I didn't really think she was going to see it or respond because I'm quite sure you was getting a lot of messages during that time. And, and, and lo and behold, you responded. And I just expressed my gratitude to you as an African-American man and the fact that you stopped and you addressed an issue. Um, me personally, I wish more Caucasian, more white people would do that. Um, so you spoke up um, for your community. Um, and, and, and in my mind, as a black man, I am a part of your community. And I know that that's not the case for a lot of white people. So I'm still um, eternally grateful for you for doing that. And so with that being said, uh, I decided to do some time after that. That whole event really kind of inspired me to put together a conference at the church that I attend, the church in which I am also on staff there. As one of the leaders there, and that church, that that conference, I'm sorry, was all about racial reconciliation and social justice. And um, Cher came, and and we sat on the stage together, and we talked about that issue. And it was it was just a blessing. It was it was emotional. It was inspiring. It was encouraging. It was transformative. It was a lot of different things. And so we have continued, and that was back in February. We have continued to at least think about it together and talk about it, which led to us doing this. So um, I know I kind of said a lot real fast, but it's just kind of uh, some of my background. But uh, when when you reached out to me and, and you talked about what you wanted to do, for one, I want to say thank you for giving me a platform to share my story because I feel like sharing my story is, is another way for me to to live out my purpose to reach people. And 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 you talked about a story of brokenness and. The truth of the matter is all of us, we all have been there. Some of us are there now. I can only imagine, now that I think about it, with everybody being quarantined and everything that's happening right now, I can only imagine some of the brokenness that people are experiencing like right now in this moment. I can only imagine that being stuck in the house um, and kind of being forced into a situation that has caused a lot of disruption and a lot of discomfort, how that has probably revealed some brokenness in people, some brokenness that they probably didn't even know was there. Because I know even myself, you know, I have been doing a lot of reflecting here lately because we don't have nothing but time to do it, right? Um, but, but there is a time in particular 
and, and I share this story a lot, back in the year of 2016. It was January 20-something of 2016, and I got laid off. Now, if you're listening to this, you may go, dude, people get laid off all the time, but just bear with me. Um, at the time, it was myself, my wife, and we had two children. And keep in mind, my boys are, they're, well, right now they're eight and six, so back then they were even younger. You know what I mean? So I got laid off, which I, for some reason I kind of felt it coming. And I was laid off for an entire six months. You know, just no, no, seems like there was no hope for me getting a job and I was trying my best. But, and, and what's crazy is I've been laid off before prior to that. But for some reason, this layoff hit me real hard for some reason. I kind of felt like, oh, man, I've been laid off before. Like this piece of cake, I can get through this. No, that was not the case. I, I, I think I really, if I'm being completely honest, I think I battled with some level of depression and anxiety. And, and I don't use those terms loosely um, because I remember walking around the house just feeling hopeless. Like I did not feel myself. I felt less than, I didn't feel like I was a man. I didn't feel like I was able to take care of my wife. I didn't feel like I was taking care of my children. Like very prideful. Like I didn't even want to ask my wife for ten dollars. You see what I'm saying? Because I felt like that that is not the natural order of things. You know what I mean? I remember walking around the house like with this intense pressure in my head, and and I'm not one half headache, so. That's when I kind of learned that with depression and anxiety, how that can have an impact on your body physically, you know, and psychologically, you know, and I'm like, man, like, am I having an anxiety attack? Like, I, I would ask myself these questions and thank God that wasn't the case. But I do think I wrestled with depression, and anxiety like you couldn't. There was I found I, with even with my wife and my kids, I couldn't find a reason to even be happy. Mm -hmm. I would be sitting on the floor playing with my kids, but deep down inside. I was, I was not happy. Like I was not okay with that scenario mm -hmm. and going on job interviews and, and, and knowing that I was capable and able and qualified and just, just getting, hearing people say no, like back to back to back to back to back. Then um, I think that turns into bitterness, which breaks you even more because basically that's just anger turned inside out and I'm going, so now I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Then now I'm wrestling with, you got the anxiety, the depression. Now here comes insecurity because I'm not good enough. Everybody's saying, no, what, what am I doing wrong? What's wrong with me? Oh, I should have did this. Oh, I should have did that. Oh, I should have thought about this. Oh, I should have said that. So now you have all these different unhealthy emotions that I am feeling each and every day. What, what made it even harder is because um, my vocation is ministry. So while I am broken and depressed and anxious and insecure, I still had to encourage and inspire other people. I still had to go and, and teach Bible study at the church and tell people that God is good and everything's going to be okay, only to go back home and wrestle with my own faith and not even believe in the things that I was telling other people. You know what I mean? And then here comes this feeling of, oh, now I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> All these different things going on at the same time. And so then while I'm unemployed, my wife um, loses her grandmother. Suddenly, I remember when, when it happened. We were laying in the bed. She was on the phone with her grandmother, laughing and joking. The next day, oh. I get a phone call. My wife is screaming. Oh. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. So uh. she had no time to brace herself. So, you know, it's different when someone is sick, they're in the hospital and you kind of go, okay, slowly but sure they're kind of drifting away. So you kind of brace yourself, but not when you're on the phone, normal day laughing and joking. Okay. I love you. Talk to you later. Next day she's gone. So I had to watch my wife wrestled with her own brokenness, but it was hard for me, I think, to really, at least I feel, she may think different. I feel like I didn't do a good job or I wasn't strong enough to cater to her brokenness because I am was just as broken. So now you got 
we're already broken as, as individuals living in a fallen world, but now you guys' life circumstances that has broken us even more. Um, and I'm like, now here I am as the man, I got to carry this load for her. And I can't because I'm hurting too. And I'm hurting because she's hurting. And, you know, I was really close to my grandmother a lot. You know what I mean? Like, so it was like, man, and I had to speak at the funeral. So I had to do the eulogy. So here I am, the preacher man in the standing on the podium, looking down at the casket. This is my wife's grandmother, a lady who I love dearly, looking over to my left and my wife. Oh. And part of and now there's the tension of two callings, right? I'm called to serve people um, by way of sharing God's love and God's word by way of being a clergyman, if you will. But yet I'm called to be a husband. So what's more important right now? So I asked my wife when my mother-in-law came to me and said, we want you to do the usual. I said, well, baby, is that okay with you? Because I felt this dying and urging need to be by her side during that moment, but I could not. But keep in mind, I, here I am wanting to serve the family and to encourage people and to lay my grandmother-in-law to rest. But I still had to go back home. No job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, money's getting low. So, you know, they, now, we're, now we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're exhausting mm -hmm. our savings account and my wife's carrying a load and she's in this. So I'm just like, okay, none of this is adding up. So then there were some other things going on um, that I can't go into details about, just some certain family dynamics where I just saw certain people in my family just, just going through it, you know, just struggling with certain things and life just hit them real hard. And, you know, sometimes when you're, when you're close to your family members, um, sometimes their issues can kind of flood into your house mm -hmm. sometimes, if, if, if you know what I mean, without going into detail. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of deal with uh, some of that. So it's kind of like almost taking the burden of somebody else's brokenness, mm -hmm. but then still trying to manage my own. Um, how do you really manage and mitigate that without coming off as being um, careless yeah. or apathetic? Um, but it, it is what it is. It happened. So after that, I remember finally getting a job, but I, it just didn't. It didn't feel right. Like I, I basically, it wasn't the job that I wanted, and I had to take that job mm. because unemployment only paid for six months okay so i was at the six month mark so it's like it didn't pay much and i remember still like kind of struggling financially even with this job i mean don't get me i'm thankful for it I, you know but it just it wasn't the job that i want and what what made it even more frustrating is i it was the organization that i wanted to work for but i interviewed for, for a particular position that would have put me where i needed to be financially but then they, the guy came back in his words and said, I wasn't ready for that position, which I knew I was, um, and put me in a position that was way lower, way lower pay grade. So I was kind of like, what was the whole point? You know what I mean? Um, now I, I'm missing out on an opportunity based on the opinion Damn. of another person who knows nothing about me. Um, yet I'm in this place and I'm seeing people when I'm like, man, what they are doing, I know I can do. Uh, probably was more experienced than they were, <laughs> but for whatever reason, it happened. And I remember even on that job, getting a paycheck, great benefits and all that, but I just felt very unfulfilled. Now I started to wrestle with uh, my faith and my purpose. Like there are things that I, I would dream about things that were so inspiring and I start to lose like my vision, so to speak. Like I, the things that I was inspiring to do that the person who I was, was aspiring to become, like before all this stuff happened, I had a very like clear vision of that. Like in X amount of years, I believe here's where I'm going to be, you know what I mean? Or here's where I would like to be. Here's what I'm, here's the goal that I'm going to press towards. So I start losing sight of that mm -hmm. as if 
there's no way possible I can make that goal or I can be the, become this, this great person that I want to become. Um, so I gave up on myself. I just, I gave up and, and every, all of my emotions, even some of my behaviors were predicated on my circumstances, meaning, you know, I probably allowed myself to have more bad days than, than good days. And, and that's my fault. Cause I really could have had more good days. Um, I recall just being snappy and just agitated with my kids and my wife and just, it just, it just altered me. Um, I didn't want to preach anymore. I, I didn't want to share my faith anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to encourage anybody anymore. And I remember I would be upset sometimes to see other people make it. And, and, and I'm like, man, like why, why am I, you know, having such a hard time? So it seems like I was broken and then some healing possibly could have came, but instead I was broken and then broke some more. So I felt like there was no progress being made. Um, so now we get deeper into the year and I'm at work. My mom calls me screaming and she goes, my oldest son, his name is Chancellor. She says, Chancellor's not responding. So as a parent, for those who have children, <laughs> you know, this, I blacked out at that point. All I heard was chances not responding. Well, in my mind, you know, well, what, what does that mean? And, you know, I dropped him off this morning. He was okay. What do you mean he's not responding? Look up. They're in the ambulance. <laughs> they're headed to Children's Medical Center in Dallas, Texas at the time. Same year. Call my wife. I'm like, man, I don't want to call her and tell her her child isn't responding. But I had to. She breaks down. She's crying. She's panicking. So I come to find out he had a seizure, which was strange. Perfectly healthy kid, seizure. Long story short, he had up to seven seizures, just random, just like back to back. And I remember that day, between like a day, like two days, we were back and forth in the emergency room because he would have the seizure. We would take him and say, hey, he's having a seizure. Doctors would say, no, he's not. We would leave get home, he'll have a seizure, take him back. He's having a seizure. No, he's not. Explain it to us. That's not a seizure. That's not like, like I'm not exaggerating. One doctor in particular, like literally argued with us. I'm not exaggerating about our child, about what is, what is a seizure and what's not. And then try to leverage her education and say, well, I'm doing my residency and I have a such and such, such and such. So I know so that was hard because as a, as a as a person of faith who hasn't always been a person of faith, <laughs> you know, you kind of get those flashbacks sometimes like, oh, my goodness, lady, if you had caught me a couple years ago <laughs> or, or I gave my life to you, like you, I would be saying some stuff to you that probably or either doing something right now that will land me in jail. Um, <laughs> and and I'm, just, I'm just being real. <laughs> I, I hear you. My wife, I was like, this lady is lucky. Like we are who we are right now. Cause this would have ended pretty bad. Yeah. Cause, now we're talking about, Cause for us, at least for us, because it was our child, it was a matter of life or death for yeah. us. Not, not that he was dying, but that's just the mold that you get in with your kids. You know what I mean? And so he, we were in the emergency room. He had a seizure. Now I didn't want to do it, but I pulled out my phone and recorded it. I, I already, <sighs> knew, I already knew they were going to say, it's not a seat. And when I showed it to them, they all put their head down. Wow. And they had to apologize. Wow. We, we could have been here admitted into the hospital, probably could have some type of way mitigated whatever the issue was sooner if you all just had to believe us the first time. So it took all of that. You know what I mean? And so that, that right there was frustrating. And I remember kind of going like, God, like, why? why does it have to be so complicated and why does it have to be so difficult? Like anybody else probably could have walked right in, you know what I mean? But why, why do we have to go through all of this? I mean, I just feel like we just couldn't get a break that year. You know, now this happened the week leading up to Christmas. So he had the seizures. Then I look up my youngest child who was, well, that was 2016, like three at the time. 
he was he was struggling breathing. He he really couldn't breathe well, so that was strange. So come to find out, he his lungs were inflamed, so he wasn't receiving a lot of air, and you could see him like struggling to breathe, and it was it was worse than we thought it was. Like we didn't give that one as much credit because it wasn't as visible as like the seizures, right? But this happened simultaneously. Simultaneously. So we took him to the ER. Long story short, both of our children were admitted to the hospital oh. at the same time. No. One on the eighth floor, one on the eleventh floor. My wife had to stay with one. I had to stay with one. One having seizures. Right. Oh my out gosh. A re- it was a respiratory infection. So a virus came from somewhere. They both got it, the virus, wow. but it affected them differently. Seizures, respiratory infection. So we stayed in the hospital for uh, nearly a week. The, but the seizure thing really freaked me out because they did an x-ray on my son's brain. He had to, you know, poking him with needles. Like, we just, I just, we just, he was like five at the time. Like, we just watched him suffer. And couldn't do anything about it. Hooking him up to a machine and looking at my youngest son breathing tube in his nose. I mean, it was just that was brutal for. Think about it. A three year old breaks my heart. Three year old and a five year old. Now I'm asking myself the question: God, why? I'm gonna be honest with you. As a person of faith, as one who has really sold himself out to Jesus Christ, I was angry. I, I just I was done. I remember going down to the chapel in that hospital, screaming at the top of my lungs, crying, asking God why I was angry. I was angry. Um, I said, now you, 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 you kind of, I kind of blame the, 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 the misfortune of the year on God. I'm like, well, you know, you, you messed up and jacked up my whole year. Now we get to the end of it when I was hoping to get some relief. Now you're trying to take my kids from me. You know what I mean? What is really going on? So now I'm starting think. Now I'm thinking, okay, did, what did I do? That's the first thing we do. What, what did I do wrong? Yeah. You know, what I mean? um, why? What is this retribution about? What is this punishment? Is it this? Is it that? And and obviously, looking back in retrospect, they had none of that was the case. But that's just how I felt in the moment. But yeah, I remember they took an X-ray of my son's brain, and this really flipped me out. I saw it was four white spots on his brain. So then I'm like. And clearly they had something to do with the seizures, but I'm like, I just stopped listening to the doctor. I ran out the room and I just, mm-hmm. I just bowed in the hallway. Cause I'm like, man, like, is this going to, cause now you're thinking, is this going to affect him neurologically for the rest of his life? Like what is, what are the, are there lasting effects and all of that? And he was a perfectly healthy kid and this came out of nowhere. Uh, so thankfully we ended up getting a really good doctor who really cared. Um, and she was very helpful, got him on medication. My other son recovered. But then now it's like, you know, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, like we were preparing to spend Christmas in the hospital. Christmas Eve, everything checked out, ran some more tests on both kids. We got discharged. Um, so we were able to send Christmas at home. And it's, it's some more things that happened that year. But it's just, it, but just emotionally, spiritually, Mentally, it, it was just, it was very uh, taxing. It was frustrating. I was, I spent most of that year angry. And even now, I mean, I, um, I can't think of one thing that year that made me happy other than my kids getting discharged from the hospital. Now, as I look back in retrospect, clearly I have a completely different perspective <laughs> about that year. Now I can say that I'm thankful for that year. Because that year made me and my wife the people that we are today, or it contributed to it. Just from the regard of being stronger people, just from the regard of being able to tell that story to someone else who may be broken, to say, hey, we we made it through it. To be able to say, I struggle with my faith. Um, not that I was going to walk away from it, but I, I asked a lot of questions, you know what I mean, um, that I never asked before and found myself angry with the God who I truly believe saved my life and, and, and most definitely carried us through that year. Um, and I'm not, and I'm not, as a, being a person of faith, I'm not ashamed to say that I was angry with my God. You know, um, it, it is what it is. 
Um, and I don't even think he's holding it against me. I really think that he he understands. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's why I love him. But I was, I was mad at how I how I got out of it. You know what? I think it took a while. You know, it, you know, I think about things that I've gone through prior to 2016. And it's like, I feel like I had more wherewithal to kind of pull myself out of it. But 2016, I feel like I couldn't. I feel like I had nothing. I had no strength. I had nothing to pull me out of that. I think I just had to go through it. Yeah. It, it, it was no getting out of it. <laughs> it was no figuring out a clever way to change the situation. I couldn't change it. I came out of it, but I couldn't pull myself out of it. I just had to weather the storm, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and it, and I think that's what made me even more frustrated about the year. No, like light at the end of the tunnel and midway through the years, like, Oh man, like made it through that. You know I mean, and I recall just praying and, Felt like no prayers were being answered. And, you know, at the end of the year after it all happened and I look back, I'm like, man, like I'm such, I was a stronger person. You know what I mean? Um, And I've gone through things after that. And to be honest, I've handled them a lot better. And I think it's because of 2016. As, as 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 much of a thorn of a f- thorn in my flesh as it was, me going through that, it it toughened me up. That's the best way I can explain it. It toughened me up, and I can look back and go, man, like if it hadn't been for that year, I probably wouldn't have been able to endure some of the things I've had to endure after that. What's interesting though about being broken during that time. It is not that I say God wanted to break me, my family, for the sake of hurting me. But if I take a pot and I, let's say, put sugar in it, and let's say if I spray paint that pot green so you you, you can't see what's on the inside of it, you just see a green pot, and that pot sits there. For a long time, and you have no idea that there is something really sweet and good on the inside of it. And you decide to come over and take that pot and you slam it down and you break it. And somebody may go, you lunatic, why did you break that pot? Well, it is because through that process of being broken that the contents on the inside come out. If it had not been broken, what was on the inside would have never came out. And I think a lot of times, a lot of us have great things on the inside of us. And it's a couple of things that have, we procrastinate and we sit around or we're waiting for somebody else to come pull this stuff out of us. Mm -hmm. Or we're scared or we're insecure or we feel like we don't have the resources or we're not smart enough or we're not qualified. So that 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 green pot just sits on the counter with all those great contents on the inside and it never budges until God or a circumstance or life itself comes and knocks that pot on the ground mm-hmm. and it breaks and those pieces shatter and all of the good stuff comes out. Then sometimes with brokenness, there are some things in us, and I believe this happened to me that year, that didn't need to be there. There were some things about me that needed to change, some thoughts that needed to change, some behaviors that needed to change. And if it had not been for that brokenness and that pain, which revealed those things to me, like, hey, you know, maybe I should be thinking about this, or I can't treat this person like this, or I can't talk to my kids like this, or I shouldn't allow this to get me this angry, or I shouldn't allow this to even depress me, or bring forth anxiety in my life, because technically I can control that stuff, then that brokenness, that brokenness revealed that to me. And so now I have more discipline, more self-control, uh, more faith, which has given me the wherewithal to handle things. Um, I remember 
uh, when was this? This was in October of last year, Halloween, matter of fact. Someone broke into our place. And I remember walking in and I looked around when I after it dawned on me that it happened. And honestly, to my surprise, I thought I was gonna flip out and just go crazy. And I remember standing there, seriously. And I looked around and I was like, well, something good is about to happen. Now, I said a few bad words after that. <laughs> like <laughs> after the, after the after some of the Christ likeness went away, then the the old Andre from the hood kind of came. <laughs> like, you, but the but the but the first response though was like, okay, and then the anger and everything said it. Like I said, I'm, I'm just being very straightforward. Um, I'm not perfect by any means, but I handled that situation way better than I thought I would. Do you, know you think I mean? that's because you have this free now and like um, appreciation for yeah. what's really important? Yeah, I do. And I think, and to me that, now I struggled a few days after that. Like it was, it was rough. After I just, after I really started contemplating on the fact that someone was stepping and violating yeah. my family. Like yeah. That. Um, yeah, I struggled. I had some days where I cried. I had some days where I was enraged, like mm-hmm. wanted to go find them you know, and whoever it was, but that was another story or another incident where I was broken. You know what? And so I'm like, man, like, why does this keep happening? Yeah. You know, but I'm like, now I have a greater appreciation for brokenness because that lets me know that something good is going to come out of it or God is preparing me for something. Even if it's just Getting on a Zoom call and sharing a story. If if my brokenness had nothing to do with me, and it was all about this moment, mm-hmm. I'm okay with that because I can't authentically talk about brokenness if I have not been broken myself. The message is not going to be as powerful or effective if I had not been broken myself. So I, I really want to encourage people to not beat themselves up so much when they go through a season of, of brokenness and, and try, and it's, it's hard to do, but try your best to be as optimistic as you can to know that this is going to make me stronger. This is going to make me better. I'm going to come out of this. I may not come out of it when I want to. It may last longer than I want it to last, but I'm going to come out of it. And there's going to be some good stuff that's going to come out of me. And there's going to be some bad things. Um, that now I can get rid of that was probably toxic to me, whether that's a job or relationships or certain behaviors. Like we all deal with that stuff, right? So during that brokenness, it's like, I'm, God, I feel like God is almost saying like, I'm going to break you because I, you're so much better than that. And you and there's so much more for you to do. And, and some of those things are really just holding you back. So since you don't want to break it, I will. And then sometimes I believe that we can make the decision to break things on our own, especially when it comes down to like practical things, like certain relationships and things like that. Like if you know that's not good for you, break away from it. You know what I mean? If you know that 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 activity or that thing or that habit or that addiction or whatever it is, if you know that that's not good for you, break away from it. You know what I mean? So I'll, I'll kind of stop with this thought. There's beauty to brokenness. Something beautiful can come out of being broken. It really can. But you, you and it's not going to always be easy to deal with it. And, and, and something else can happen to me tomorrow. And, it, and, and I may struggle with it. You know what I mean? But I do have this kind of this newfound perspective that when 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 I find myself being broken, it's like, okay, if I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm like, okay, I got to respond to this the right way. And if I respond to it the right way, then yes, yeah, beauty will most definitely come out of the brokenness. So... Hey everyone, 
Thank you so, so much for tuning in and for helping me to connect with other moms of addicts or loved ones who are struggling with addiction in their lives. If you have questions for me, comments, suggestions on future show content, or perhaps there's a topic, a specific topic that you would like to hear from an expert in the field, I would love to hear from you. I am also interested in sharing your voice. So if you have messages of hope or personal stories that you think would resonate with our listeners, please send me an email. You can type me out a message or you can include an attachment um, to an audio clip with your voice. You can send that to Shar at beyondhoperadio.com. And with that, thank you again. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Beyond Hope. For show notes and more, head on over to beyondhoperadio.com. A huge thank you to recoveryinnovators.com and James Healy. Thank you so much for putting up with me (laughs) and for helping me to um, produce and launch the show. I couldn't have done it without you. You are so awesome. And to anybody else who has been considering uh, working with James, highly recommend him. Please go over to his website and check it out, recoveryinnovators.com.